All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, hello to everyone who's here at McDowell NYC on 23rd Street and to everyone who's seeing this in streaming land. This is um, one of our first hybrid events, so bear with us if there's any technical difficulties, but I think there's so much warmth and love in this room that it will carry us through the event. Um, I have the privilege of being McDowell's uh, Vice President of Advancement. My name is Stacy Bosworth, and I'm so happy to welcome everyone here tonight for the second annual Catherine Min Fellowship event. And it will be a little different every year, which I love. Hopefully, it will always be in person. Um, and we're just happy to have this be our first event of 2022 in New York. And so uh, the first thing I wanted to do was to thank the Min family for being here, for putting together a permanently endowed fellowship in Catherine's name. And what that means is so many things. It means that Catherine's work and legacy of friendship and spirit and writing will live on. And it also means that people will come to know that there is a place for Asian American writers at McDowell in residency programs in this country. And to us, that's so important that one, two, three students might hear about this or people who never thought to apply to a residency program. So it's to honor Catherine's work and keep her legacy alive through the fellows that get the award each year. And we have two of them here tonight who you'll meet shortly. Um, so thank you to the Min family. I also wanted to thank Jenny Wu, who has been working at McDowell for eight years. She's our internal communications and human engagement director. And she worked with the Min family from the beginning to put this together. So thank you, Jenny. I just want to thank, shout out to our New York events team, Brett and Gina, for putting tonight together. And with that, I'm going to not give too much of an introduction to Alexander Chi, two-time McDowell fellow, writer, fantastic human, who's going to emcee our <laughs> evening. Thank you for being here. <sighs> I'm just thinking of uh, something Eileen Miles said at an event about six months ago now where she was we were at uh, the Dia Center space and she was talking about how in the old days part of what defined power was what you could do up in front of the mic that nobody in the audience could do and back then it was smoking <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I don't know if this defines power exactly but maybe community care which I uh, another kind of power um Oof, I have just spent a lot of time thinking about uh, Asian American writing, uh, partly because uh, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month just has concluded, partly in my role as, uh, as the this year's editor for Best American Essays. Um, I wrote about this in the letter that went out to uh, donors, uh, in case you missed that letter, um, uh, donors to this fund in particular. Uh, I was remembering how when I met Catherine, it was at a time when uh, all of us Korean American writers knew exactly who each other was because there were so few of us. And every time we found each other in a new space, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Who are you? <laughs> Tell me everything. <laughs> you know, like, um, uh, Catherine became a part of uh, uh, a Facebook group that uh, Marie Myung Lee and I run uh, called Fourth Kingdom uh, for Korean American writers and, uh, and was quickly kind of a den mother, uh, self-appointed for the organization. <laughs> um, and uh, and I think about her a lot. So it's it's really beautiful to gather here and think about her work and remember this and and to kind of help both further her legacy and also create newer opportunities for up and coming Asian American writers. So thank you so much, all of you, for being here tonight and supporting this in whatever capacity 
uh, you are currently, it means the world. So we, I don't think I have an order here exactly. I'm going to in just introduce the three of them. How about that? <laughs> and then uh, we will do some, we will do some reading and talking. Uh, Jessica She, McDowell Fellow and Catherine Min Fellowship recipient, 2020, uh, began working on a historical novel set at McDowell, sorry, at McDowell. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> that would be pretty funny. Has anyone done that yet, <laughs> actually? Anyway, um, s about a 19th century Chinese-American family in California. Set in San Francisco during ex Chinese exclusion, the novel explores family life, intergenerational relationships, ancestry, and how the Chinese undertook one of the earliest mass civil rights movements in the United States. Jessica is also finishing a collection of short stories that explore migration, lineage, and questions of identity and belonging among first-generation Chinese Americans. Prior to transitioning into full-time writing, Jessica has held two decade-long careers. From 2010 to 2019, she owned a yoga and spine health studio in Emeryville, California. From 1999 to 2009, she worked for J.P. Morgan Chase on Wall Street and in Asia Pacific, holding positions in internal consulting, private banking, investment banking strategy, and business development. Uh, seated next to her is the wonderful Lisa Ko, McDowell Fellow 2014, 2021, and Catherine Min Fellowship recipient 2021. She is the author of The Leavers, which was a national bestseller and a 2017 National Book Award for Fiction finalist. It won the 2016 Penn Bellwether Prize for Socially Engaged Fiction and was a finalist for the 2018 Penn Hemingway Award. Her short fiction has appeared in Best American Short Stories and her essays in nonfiction in the New York Times, The Believer, and elsewhere. Her second novel is forthcoming from Riverhead Books. She is a recipient of fellowships from Hedgebrook, McDowell, the Black Mountain Institute at the University of Nevada, UCross, Blue Mountain Center, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, and has taught creative writing in many settings. She lives in New York City. Um, I used to joke teach writing, see the world. Anyway, many settings. <laughs> um, uh, Kaylee Min Andrews is Catherine Min's daughter, uh, also my former student. Uh, she lives in New Orleans where she teaches English to international students and is a member of the Podunk Writers Alliance. Did I get that correctly? Um, she has been published in Asymptote, literary trans in literary translation, and halfway down the stairs, for creative nonfiction. Her flash essay, Old Kleenex, was nominated for a Best of the Net 2020. Kayla is working on a collection of autobiographical short stories. All right. And first up is Jessica, yeah. who has her own mic. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know how to follow that up. <laughs> um, so when I was thinking about the many, many things that I wanted to say about my McDowell experience, I've been pondering that for the last several weeks, which gave me a lot of anxiety. <laughs> and I don't know if there's anything I can really narrow it down to as everything, you know, that I've heard, I've experienced the, the, the freedom to create, the freedom to fail. And one of the things that I felt just now being back there with Kayla and Lisa was just the humanity of all of us being writers, struggling and figuring out where our work is going. You know, for me, trying not to attach my self-worth to every sentence that I write incorrectly or being back in New York and seeing um, my friends raising their children, raising these amazing humans, and I am stuck for an hour trying to figure out if I'm going to use a semicolon or not. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, and I want to say that you know, as a Chinese American, it's hard to say, hey, this is really tough. This is really, really tough. Um, and I think McDowell gave me that initial safety blanket when I first transitioned into writing because my first two careers were so linear. It was so like 
this is what you do as an Asian American. This is what success looks like. And when I finally made the plunge and say, okay, I'm going to write full time, all of my friends and family are like, when's it coming out? When is it coming out? <laughs> you know? And it, it just felt so wonderful being in a place where that didn't matter. It was really the work and having fun. And it's really great seeing George, whom I met at McDowell. Um, so uh, I was going to read a little bit of my novel, but um, I decided to read something slightly less depressing. <laughs> and this is, this is the beginning of a short story. Um, I wrote it this past summer as I was thinking quite a bit about childhood. And it's like the first three and a half pages of about a 12-page um, story. And it's just about a moment in childhood, about faith in adults, in the larger world. It's called Jesus on the Great Wall. I found Jesus the year I turned seven. He was waiting for me inside a volume of Western oils that took up half of our coffee table. Lifting its cover, I tumbled into another world. Between the winged babies and armored men, nude women danced in open meadows. Farmers slept while the sun was still up. Until then, the only paintings I knew were of the chairman or PLA soldiers or cropped hair. Turning the pages, my face reddened with the saturations of hue, flesh, leisure. The moment I came upon him, my fingers stilled. From the dark hair and beard that blurred into the background rose a pale, sad face. Gentle eyes looked back at me and drew inward at the same time, as if he too were full of questions. His expression illuminated something I could only relate to at the time as patience, the kind I had never seen on the faces of the adults around me. And not knowing what to make of it, I stared at it, day after day, feeling comforted when I could close my eyes and recall his face. My father had purchased the art book from a shop on the Bund. It was the second half of the 1980s when China reopened its doors to the West and everything from Marlboro's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Budweiser, and Disney streamed in. Each family wanted to own and show off something from Europe or America. Western oils took its turn in the laps of my father's friends who visited us, men who stared at the naked women and said, capitalism is beautiful. <laughs> One evening, sidling beside him on the sofa while he flipped through the volume, I pointed to the portrait. He was in a good mood, so he told me about Jesus the same way he told me about Zeus and the Monkey King. People believe he performed miracles, he said. What kind, I asked healing cancer and giving sight back to the blind. Was it true? Do you choose to be smart or believe everything you hear? With my father, all the, uh, almost every question was a test. The times I failed, there would be a narrowing of his eyes or a quick baring of his teeth that made my heart skip. Fearing it, I stopped myself from asking about the miracles the chairman had performed. At school, we sang songs about Mao being the sun, the moon, the father of our nation. Though he had died only a decade before I was born, in my mind, he was as old as myth. And I began to think of him and Jesus as buddies. In the movies, the bad guys would always manage to rally together, and it didn't seem far-fetched that Mao and Jesus consulted each other on how to save. When my father talked about the cross and the crown, he left out the nails and the thorns. Pain was not something he dwelled upon, because then he'd feel, feel guilty about whipping me. So for a while, I believed the crown and cross were Jesus' personal swag like how Buddha had a lotus to sit in, and the willow branch was the goddess of mercy's magic wand. There were so many deities that a crescent blade or a fat peach was necessary to help distinguish one god from the other. You wouldn't leave offerings for the moon goddess if you were praying for your unborn child to grow a penis. The summer before we left for America, my father took my mother and me on a trip to the capital. I was eight, and I suppose he didn't want me to leave the homeland without having visited the forbidden city. Standing under a mountain of roofs blocking out the sun, my father said, the heart of China, or what's left of it. After we passed through the meridian gate, crossed the arch bridges and stopped in front of the Hall of Harmony, he said, see the interlocking brackets under the eaves? No nails, still standing after five centuries. Teacher Wang said the foreigners burned the palaces and stole a lot of treasures. They did, he said, and so did the communists. My mother slapped his shoulder. You know they're listening. My father shrugged. It was the first time I had heard him contradict my teachers. Before I could open my mouth to defend our leaders, he grabbed my hand and said, hands not much bigger than yours built all of this, each panel of lattice window, each lion carved from stone, all for a man. 
a man who claimed he descended from heaven. The same heaven as Jesus? My father squeezed my hand and I knew I had disappointed him. He looked away from me and lent his eyes to the tourists gathered at the steps in the front of the temple of heaven. My hand hurt, but I was relieved that he was still holding it. After a moment, he said, everyone wants to think he is important. We all want something to believe in. Where we're going, you don't know the language or what the people want from you, so you must think for yourself. His eyes hardened when he finally looked at me, and I knew this was something he wanted me to remember. The next day, we took a bus to see the Great Wall. In the plaza at the entrance, peddlers sold straw hats, trinkets, popsicles, and bottles of Coca-Cola. One man had rows of watches clipped to his shirt pockets and fake gold chains dangling from his forearm. At the end of each was a charm, half moon, locket, elephant, serpent, six-pointed star. Is that a cross? I asked. The man entangled the chain and handed it to my father. 20, he said, good price. Baba, he sighed. When I thought he wouldn't relent, he handed the man five yuan and his remaining cigarettes. I wanted him to slip the chain around my neck, but he had already turned his back. As I pressed my fingers into the hard points of the cross, I believed I was special. I had Jesus while the other kids were stuck with plain old Buddhas. Ascending the steps of the Great Wall, my father said it would take three days and nights to traverse the length of it by train. It's what's both great and terrible about our country, he said, and my mother again told him to shut up. The white stone path climbed and dipped with the mountainside. I shot ahead of my parents, the cross, the cross bouncing against my breastbone. I looked through the openings in the wall at the treetops and the gray blue sky, ran from one guard post to the other with my arms spread wide, laughing and out of breath. My father told me a lot on that trip. What he left out was the 400,000 lives it took to build that wall and the bodies crushed and mixed into the rammed earth. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs>
those gifts really just fed me for the winter and are still continuing to feed me um, through the spring. Um, and last thing I'll say is that I worked in a studio called New Jersey in November. Um, and one of the names that I remember taking note of on the wall with the list of residents that had formerly worked there was Catherine's. Um, and I think that's such, I don't know, it made me realize that was such an important part of also um, being a fellow at McDowell is being able to situate yourself and see your work as part of a lineage. Um, and for me in particular, a lineage of Asian American authors and women authors um, and to see to see what I'm doing as something that's part of something bigger, um, both both historically and also, you know, in the future. So it's truly an honor to be a part of Catherine's lineage. Um, so thank you so much to both McDowell and the Min family um, for being here tonight. Um, so I'm gonna read a few pages from my second novel, which is for now called Memory Piece. I actually turned in this draft to my editor like five days ago, so I feel like in publishing time, maybe it'll be out in like two years. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> the future is uncertain. Um, uh, a little context, th this novel follows three characters from the 1980s through the 2040s. Um, and I'm just gonna read a few pages from the first section where you'll see two of the characters, Giselle Ong, um, Giselle Chin and Jackie Ong. Um, and here they're around 15 years old and they live in suburban New Jersey in the mid 1980s. Giselle and Jackie didn't see each other now that they no longer went to Chinese school, which was for little kids. They didn't talk on the phone, they sent each other mail. In a large envelope that included ads from 17 sullied and Sharpie, Giselle wrote to Jackie about drinking wine coolers at a party while the host family was away. And here's the thing, we were in Craig's kid sister's room on this bed with a pink ruffle and stuffed animals everywhere. And don't tell anyone this, but when I was making out with Craig, I felt so weird and lonely and sad. Jackie wrote back, sometimes in the winter when it's four in the afternoon and I'm alone in the house, I'll play a 45 and watch the record spinning and you can see on the label how long the song is and I'll think, now I am four minutes and two seconds closer to death. Now, three minutes and 59. Now, now, now. The rest of the page was filled up with the same word again and again in increasingly smaller letters. Jackie's aesthetic was stripped down, monochrome. Now, 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 now. Christmas was a subdued affair at the chins. They exchanged practical gifts and reused wrapping paper, slippers, hats, socks, plastic squirt pumps of Kerry lotion and Jurgen's moisturizer and ate pensit in front of the TV. They went to midnight mass on Christmas Eve so they could stay in their pajamas the next day. The phone rang on the morning of the 26th and Giselle was surprised when it was for her. It was Jackie Ong. What are you doing? Nothing, Giselle said. Let's go to the mall, Jackie said. Let's get some orange Julius. <laughs> they met at Paramus Park because their parents refused to drive them 20 minutes further to drop them off at Garden State Plaza. Paramus Park was for babies and old people. It was where you went because you couldn't get anywhere else. But Jackie was waiting by the fountain, dressed in a slouchy black blazer, black leggings, and a black baseball cap. One side of her hair was cut longer than the other, bangs smoothed down under the rim of her hat. Jackie was a type of beautiful that people didn't immediately notice. You thought you were the first to discover it, and then it was all you saw. She was thin and tall, sure-footed, boobless with perfect posture, a quick, unfeathered confidence, mostly seen in alpha white girls. When picking Giselle up at Chinese school, her mother once commented on Jackie's bone structure, the arch of her eyebrows, the tip of her infrequent smile, and her petite, symmetrical face. Merry Christmas, Giselle said, trying to slow her walk. Around Jackie, she always felt like she stomped when she moved. She hoped she didn't sound corny. Season's greetings, Jackie said. I have something for you. I have something for you. They exchanged cassette tapes wrapped in magazine pages. They chomped on great bubble gum and practiced blowing bubbles inside bubbles. Let's get orange Juliuses, Jackie said. And Giselle said, oh, I love orange Julius. Jackie's tone, deadpan and breezy, allowed Giselle to feel like they were playing at being white girls and in doing so, making fun of them. 
In the food court, they spotted three boys in denim jackets, preppy with fluffy hair and collared shirts. Well, la-di-da, Jackie said. Very European, Giselle said. It was understood without saying that they were doing this as a prank. Not seriously, not like with Giselle's other friends. They palmed tubes of lip gloss and a hard compact of eyeshadow and slid them into the pockets of their coats. They walked calmly past the sales girls, restocking banana hair clips and body spray, past the chess king, past the magic eye store where Giselle could never see any of the pictures. They're coming for us, Giselle whispered, half joking, the sales girls. Jackie whispered, I won't let them get us. They linked arms and walked faster. I can hear their heels clicking and clacking, click, 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 whispered Giselle. They turned down a passageway and Giselle twisted the knob of a blank gray door, not expecting it to open, but it did. Jackie stepped inside. They entered a hallway, which led to another door, which led to a room, and then they were in the guts of the building, in a dusty windowless space with two by fours and some plastic tarp. It was dark, it smelled of sawdust. They heard a rustle. A mouse, Jackie said. Giselle said, let's go. I'll stop there, thanks so much. <laughs> Um, I'd like to start by saying a huge thank you um, to Gina, to Brett, to Jenny, Stacy, and everyone at McDowell who worked so thoughtfully on this event and on the fellowship. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to say a special thank you to my uncle, Colin Min. Um, <laughs> Colin, you, you made this fellowship happen. Um, we helped, but your, you brought your vision and your skills and your determination, and you made it happen. And it's a beautiful testament to your love for your sister and for your family, and thank you. Um, and huge thank you to Alex, uh, Jessica, and Lisa for being here. And thank you to everyone for coming. After mom got diagnosed in 2014, when she knew the cancer would end her life, she grew fond of saying, it would have been a waste if I'd been hit by a truck. It was a very mom thing to say. <laughs> um, when she would say it in the hospice center, the nurses always nodded sagely, like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think she was expressing that she felt this was the right death for her, that by getting cancer, by being taken slowly, she was given time to reflect on her life and on her art and to grapple with what it all means. Um, I think she was saying, thank God I get to write about dying and all the thoughts it's unleashing in me as I do it. And knowing she was dying necessitated a change of form in her writing. So mom had a, a complete, solid, polished draft of a new novel called The Fetishist um, when she was diagnosed. Uh, the Fetishist was, it's very different from Secondhand World, her first novel. Um, it has many characters, many different storylines, um, crazy things like kidnapping, attempted murder, um, decades long grudges and revenge. And it's told in a kind of cheeky, omniscient narration um, with long Baroque sentences, sort of Nabokovian, if you will. And um, yeah, it, all she had left to do was polish it up and send it out. So 
if she had wanted to spend her remaining time on that, um, I think it's very realistic. She could have seen it published in her lifetime and maybe she could have spent some of her remaining time uh, being interviewed, being feted, you know, seeing people enjoy the novel, um, watching the positive reviews roll in, popping champagne bottles. Um, but she didn't choose that. Instead, uh, immediately after her diagnosis, she abandoned that novel. She never touched it again. She switched to short, intimate, personal essays reflecting on her life as an artist. She felt that she had been stripped bare by the cancer. And this feeling of being stripped bare showed in her writing from that point onward. That's why she didn't want to polish an existing novel. She felt an urgency to race against the clock and create new work in a completely different genre. So when she would say, it would have been a waste if I'd been hit by a truck, I think she was expressing a cheeky and heavy gratitude at having the time to, to finish, to roll up her sleeves and write a little more and write these essays for us. So I want to read one of the essays for you. This one is called On Reading and Empathy. On Reading and Empathy. Here is the epilogue to my abandoned novel, The Fetishist, which I stumbled upon just now as I was cleaning out my office. A murderer might be counted on for a fancy prose style, as the exiled lepidopterist Mr. N once observed, but his HH was also a lover, a dreamer, a madman, a sad man, a fabulist, and, most decidedly, a fetishist. And if any of us in the literary realm know anything about anything, which of course we don't, it is that we turn to the likes of H.H., E. Bovary, and Anna Kay, when we ourselves, most of us living more moderate and savory lives, feel the blood pulse of unbalanced passion rising up in our veins. And it is, in turn, through language, through the tremor and tumult, the torrent, the shock, the shill, and the shiver of words on the page that we are brought along, following the bouncing ball to something like an understanding of what it means to stand naked and wobbling in another person's buskins. Thus, when the alchemy is complete, you cannot separate you from them cannot distinguish the tragedy of fiction from the tragedy of your own life, from the tragedy of the world, and schadenfreude is no longer possible. Reading it over now, I am both proud and embarrassed. Proud because I still like the listy, tripping rhythm of the sentences, the mouthfeel of words like madman, sad man, or shock, shill, and shiver. And because, like H.H., or that show-off Mr. N., I groove on the wink-wink omniscience, the aristocratic control and authority of the distant third-person perspective. Embarrassed because it's so self-consciously literary with its reference to buskins. Buskins? <laughs> its use of words like alchemy and schadenfreude, and its invocation of famous literary characters. Pretentious? Certainly. Arch? A bit. But reading it now, with several years distance, knowing that the book was abandoned and that my life has taken this grave turn, I am inclined to feel tender toward my younger self. She was serious-minded anyway, and ambitious, and there is something in her voice with its grand declarations, its holding forth, 
that I recognize as a precursor to the essayist's voice. But more than this, what she is talking about here, when you strip away all the fancy pants constructions, is empathy. The kind of empathy that good books can engender, whether fiction or non. Because that is what it all goes back to, isn't it? To the time when we were small and first connected with a character in a book, caring about her as deeply as we cared about ourselves, completely investing in the outcome. For me, it was fairy tales. Cinderella, Hansel and Gretel, Red Riding Hood, all the grim, grim stories of cruelty, abandonment, trickery, and betrayal. Hans Christian Andersen's The Ugly Duckling, The Red Shoes, and above all, The Snow Queen. I felt, along with the boy Kay, the splinter of glass that pierced his heart and eye, felt the hard, sharp point of pain in my own chest, saw laid out before me the glittering coldness of the world, desert of ice and snow. I was attracted to the darker stories, the more gruesome details, the stepsisters cutting off their toes to fit the slipper, the woodcutter cleaving the wolf in two, the queen demanding the huntsman return with Snow White's lungs and liver. I identified with the stepsisters, who were ugly, awkward, and peevish, with the bad fairy who was not invited to the christening, with the funny little man who was promised a baby in return for spinning straw into gold. I held an early affinity for outliers, for the doleful, aggrieved creatures that bellowed with longing and loss. There was something thrilling in their wickedness, their transgression against the good, the pretty, and the powerful. It was the revenge of the not chosen, those without fortune or favor. And even from the youngest age, I felt myself among them. Most writers I know are lonely people. In order to observe the world, you need to remain slightly separate from it. And for most writers, this feeling of separateness comes from early trauma, a childhood illness, an unstable family life, the death of a parent, and the talent for watchfulness, for gauging the emotional temperature and offering up explanations for others' behavior is developed out of necessity. In my case, it was my brother's death when I was four. My parents' grief was a thorny labyrinth in which they hid and in which I wandered for four years until my other brother was born. My childhood then was suspended between two boys, one a giggling baby, then a ghost, the other a substitute, a redemption, and me, the girl child, left to her own devices seeking solace in books. The precocious young reader soon encounters a strange paradox. Without much real life experience of your own, you are exposed to a host of experiences in literature, many of them extreme in nature, cruelty, violence, sexual desire, ambition, abject poverty. You fall in love with Heathcliff, you murder Alyona Ivanovna. You run away from Mr. Rochester. But in reality, you are an eighth grader living in a suburb of Albany. <laughs> you are learning about life from books, extrapolating from the situations you read about, looking for clues on how to negotiate the real world. This can be a dangerous proposition. No 13-year-old girl should try to derive life lessons from Henry Miller. <laughs> but as much as reading helps to cultivate empathy for other people, it is also vital in developing compassion for one's self. 
You think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, James Baldwin said, but then you read. It makes for a richness of experience, exploring the range of human emotion and behavior, encountering things you don't understand, expanding your worldview, and recognizing within all the vast array your own strange and familiar self. This happens most in what I call moments of amplification, those passages that seem to lift off the page to declare higher truths, strange, beautiful, resonant, alarming, that both resound with universal significance and seem to speak to me alone. Here is one from Lolita. This, then, is my story. I have reread it. It has bits of marrow sticking to it, and blood, and beautiful bright green flies. At this or that twist of it, I feel my slippery self eluding me, gliding into deeper and darker waters than I care to probe. Here is another from To the Lighthouse. What is the meaning of life? That was all, a simple question, one that tended to close in on one with years. The great revelation had never come. The great revelation perhaps never did come. Instead, there were little daily miracles, illuminations, matches struck unexpectedly in the dark. In my own writing, I was always striving for these moments of amplification, often at the detriment of plot. Here's one I found from early in The Fetishist. When someone dies, our impulse is to flatten her out, to press her between wax paper like a leaf or fix her in amber like a bug, death as capture death as collected works. But death is a false terminus, one moment only. It seems more significant because it is the last moment, the most recent, when really it is the smallest and least telling. Life is the plumpness of all directions, of surprises and contradictions, of impulses, mistakes, duplicities, and redemptions while the vanishing point on the horizon is a dot, a blip, the same for us all. Strange that what was a theoretical observation back then should read so poignantly now, for it is precisely the plumpness of all directions that I seek to memorialize, not the common vanishing point. If reading as a young girl, <laughs> my grandmother, <laughs> um, for it is precisely the plumpness of all directions that I seek to memorialize, not the common vanishing point. If reading as a young girl opened me to the possibilities of life, and allowed me to cloak myself in the experience and wisdom of others, then writing as a 57-year-old woman with stage four cancer, my own life possibilities dwindling, allows me to inhabit my own experience and wisdom. If reading as a young girl expanded my ability to feel empathy for others, then writing for me now is an attempt to extend that compassion to myself, starting with the lonely kid who identified with Rumpelstiltskin. I want to wobble around in her buskins for a while. Thank you.
If I remember correctly, I think this is a Q&A period. Is that right, Brent? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the thumb. Um, let's see. I, I wondered if I could ask uh, our fellows to reflect a bit on, a bit more on what it meant uh, to, to have the fellowship. If you would mind expanding upon that. First, in my nervousness, I completely forgot to say how honored I am for this fellowship because at first when I got it, I, I promise you I'm going somewhere, <laughs> I was so <laughs> nervous. I was like, I don't deserve this. I actually called Courtney Bethel and said, I, I, maybe I'm not the right person. Give it to someone who's more further along their career. And then I read Secondhand World and I felt so seen I felt so goosebumpy, like just listening to this. And I was like, you know, we would have hung out. If I met Catherine at McDowell, she would she would have been like an auntie, you know? She would, uh, so thank you so much. Um, the fellowship meant so much to me in the sense that, you know, for the longest time, my family didn't, my dad, who was an artist himself, pushed me away from writing and from art because he believed that it would be a really hard life for me. And, you know, God bless Amy Tan, but growing up, that was the only role model I had. And being at McDowell, being awarded this fellowship was this kind of first, you know, oh my gosh, I'm having imposter syndrome. I didn't even know what that was until I got to McDowell. And at the same time, being in it, seeing, meeting all these amazing artists at various stages of their careers was so thrilling and so comforting and so anchoring for me because I feel like I needed that experience to move into the pandemic, to be completely lonely and writing on my own and just sometimes just completely flopped on the floor and wondering like, what am I doing? <laughs> so I hope that answered that, yeah. That's great, thank you. Mm. <coughs> uh, Lisa, you mentioned a bit about like discovering that you were in the same cabin that she had been in and lineage that was um, really profound I wondered if you could say a little bit more about um, I guess about your experience uh, of that and then anything else that seems connected to it sure um, yeah you know I think w one of the things that I did notice in the cabin and this was before I found out um, that I had received the fellowship was taking note of all the other Asian American women writers on that wall. Um, and I, I distinctly remember doing that from people that I knew personally, friends of mine to you know authors that I admired like Catherine and Kathy Park Long's name is on there and all these other writers. And I think what, you know, like what we were saying before, we were talking about this before, before the reading too, is just how, I don't know, just how much it feels like we're often working alone. Um, at least that's been my experience too. And, and also just being somebody who has been writing for most of her life, but didn't publish a book until my early 40s. Um, and and sort of thinking about what you mentioned, Alex, about like, you know, a few decades ago, there was just a small handful of other Korean American and other Asian American authors. We all knew each other. And, and now, you know, we're kind of situated in a place where we can't even keep track. Um, and can't, you know, we don't even know all the titles that are out there. Um, and I think just sort of, it feels so grounding, I think, to sort of situate myself, um, you know, as somebody who has one book out but has been doing this for so long and to sort of be reminded that, you know, we're part of something greater, I think, <laughs> um, and that there's been so many of us doing this for so long. Um, and it, it feels really, I don't know, just really heartwarming and also really nourishing um, in terms of doing our work moving forward. There was something that uh, came into my focus recently, a survey of, um, of American publishing from 1950 to 2018 that was published in the New York Times in December of 2020. And 95% uh, of the books published 
from that period were by white authors. So I just want you to all think about that <laughs> for a little bit with me. Um, uh, and then Kayla, I thought I would ask you to reflect a little bit on something connected to, so you are, obviously you're doing your own writing now. Uh, I'm wondering if thinking about your mom's legacy this way has caused you to reinterpret or interpolate some of the memories you have of her from when you were younger. Um, things that maybe didn't make sense to you at the time, but make sense now. I don't know, is there anything like this? Yeah, I think uh, when you're little, you just assume that you know your parents are godlike and they know what they're doing and it's all, of course they're gonna have success in whatever they're trying to do. And um, as I've become an adult and become a writer myself, looking back, just thinking about, um, you know, she published her first short story in her early 30s and then was publishing short stories, publishing short stories, and, um, and I believe wrote four other novels that didn't end up selling. Um, just looking back on, on you know, how, how long <laughs> the struggle is and how long the apprenticeship is and without any guarantee of success, just to be doing it and doing it and, um, somehow my parents ended up in rural New Hampshire. So that's where I grew up and that's where my mom was just kind of writing and working a day job, you know, for decades. And as a kid, it didn't strike me how, how brave that was and just how determined she was and that there was no guarantee that any of it was necessarily, you know, it's just, you don't know. Um, and so, yeah, thinking back on like, kind of vaguely remembering her finding an agent, her getting, and then her first novel coming out uh, when I was in college. Um, yeah, just just the amount of self-belief that it takes to keep doing it and, and to not give up and to just keep slowly building um, strikes me now as really incredible. Thank you. Um, so for those of you who are here with us tonight, does anyone have any questions you want to ask of the readers? It's okay if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I would throw it open, just, just in case. I see a hand in the back, last row. Yes. Hi, Gina. going to repeat it for everybody who didn't. Yeah, uh, the question was, uh, how do your parents feel about your art practice now? If you are, if you want to answer that. I did the smart, good thing. I bought them a house. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went into investment banking and did everything I was supposed to, but I kept that writing seat alive. So now they can't really complain because they live in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank God, that is magnificent. <laughs> what an incredible move. <laughs> uh, there was another question, I think. Yes, sir. I think it was in the early 2000s. Um, but I just remember there's a whole section where she talks about Asian American writers and just how, like, we all kind of have something in common. We all are kind of like a club with common reference points, but also we're all so different. And, like, of course, sometimes we're not going to like what each other is doing or appreciate each other's, you know, aesthetically each other's work. Or, um, 
and she dishes a little bit more, which I won't do, but if you find the essay, you can find out what she thinks about some of these writers. <laughs> Is that on her website? Yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, for those of you who aren't familiar with this issue, this is one of the oldest uh, grudge fights in Asian American literature. Uh, it's so rancorous, I'm almost hesitant to discuss it at all, sir, because quite frankly, it has created nothing good. Like, the discussion of it has created nothing good for anyone involved. So, on the one hand, I appreciate uh, your sort of somehow deep archival knowledge of this terrible, bitter fight. <laughs> um, but also, like, I have no desire to get sucked into it and suddenly find myself the subject of an op-ed by Frank Chin. Um, so, uh, so I will just say that I think that, like, it is preposterous, preposterous, uh, for, uh, given the statistics about publishing, for him to have have made that attack. Um, such bad faith. But anyway, there you have it. <laughs> yeah. I was just curious how all you writers feel like Asian American writers are being um, viewed now, and if it does feel like there's a lot of opportunity, or if it still feels like you have to I guess so. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it makes, I guess it makes me think of just the difference between writing and publishing. And also, I wish I had the statistics for how white publishing is, but I don't, but I'm sure it's up to 95%, like you mentioned. 93%. 93%. So, yeah, pretty, pretty close. Um, so yeah, you know the business. There's like the business of writing, and then there's the business of, of publishing in terms of who's who's you know editorially gatekeeping and how your work is being marketed and in what way. And and I, I know that as a writer, like I don't know, it just feels like it's so out of your control in some ways. Um, and and while it feels like there's such like numbers wise, there's such a huge increase of. Asian authors out there than there was when I started writing in the 90s. Um, but on the other hand, I do wonder like how, you know, what the expectations are for what stories were, are privileged over others and, and how, and how they're being sold um, to different audiences and sort of all the kind of challenges and minefields that come up for us um, in the process of publishing um, and sort of being public in the world. I want to add a little bit. Um, my agent just basically time up told me, I'm not publishing you because you're Asian. You have to make it good. <laughs> and so I feel the same thing as Lisa. I'm just so blown away by, even though there's so many immigrant stories, there's so many stories that reflect my life, it's just so much richer now. And it, there's, it's not taking away from anybody else. It's more just adding layers and layers. You know, one of my... Recently, I read um, Anthony Best Masso, whose work just moved me just to tears. And it gives me the, just an extra thing like, okay, I can tell my story the way I want to, and that's only good. Um, I will say that once in a while, I do get very, very well-meaning friends who are like, you know, I tell them, well, what is your novel about? I tell them like, oh, you know so-and-so's writing this, so-and-so, and they're always like mentioning Asian American authors, I'm like, is it because they're Asian or because their book is good? But that's my thing, you know, so, yeah. So I've been writing uh, for 30 years and no one gets published because they're Asian, just so we're clear about that. Right, <laughs> right. It literally doesn't happen. Um, you can let that go. Yeah. <laughs> um, it literally never happens. Uh, the statistic alone that I mentioned uh, earlier is, uh, is proof of that. Um, it was the kind of thing, I was thinking about it 
because when I first started taking writing classes in 1990, like the Times piece has the chart of like the different uh, percentages. It was never, I think, higher than 11%. Um, and the, in 1990, the bar was so low that you can't even look to see how much it is. Like, and then that year, I was being told very confidently by white classmates, oh, you're definitely going to get published because you're, you know, you're Asian. Uh, they, don't want, they don't want white writers anymore. And I was like, <laughs> wow, <laughs> so interesting. Um, and so I just it, I had this kind of huge surge of rage to look at that and to remember all those conversations over the years. And um, anyway, so feel free to look it up and send it to anybody who says that to you. Um, uh, but, you know, I think there, there's incredible books out now um, to be more positive. Uh, and I have all of these incredible students who are publishing now. I had this amazing uh, workshop at Tin House in 2018 with um, all of these writers who are starting to appear on bookshelves now. Uh, most recently, uh, uh, a novel called Disorientation by Elaine C. H. Chu, uh, which is a hilarious academic satire about Asian American studies. Um, and it w as I was reading the novel, I was thinking about how few, if any, Asian American fiction satirists we have. Like, people working in that category, male or female or whatever gender. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, uh, Zane Khalid's Brother Alive comes out uh, this August. Uh, he's, um, it's a, it's set in uh, <laughs> Staten Island. I was like, what is that place? <laughs> <laughs> and it's about three transnational adoptee brothers who are all adopted by this imam. Um, they each have a, a point of view in the novel. It, uh, one is Korean, one is Pakistani. Uh, I'm not remembering the ethnicity of the third. Um, but it's, it's just an incredible novel. Is it Asian American fiction? Uh, I think so. Um, but it's uh, it's its own sort of remarkable aesthetic act. Um, Nuclear Family by uh, Joseph Kahn, an extraordinary Korean American novel coming out uh, next week. Um, uh, you know, so just there's books like we've never had before. Really, a lot to celebrate, um, and I hope. Uh, I hope we will see so many more of them as this fellowship continues and the work of McDowell continues as well. So, fingers crossed. <laughs> Thank you so much.